Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. On today's episode, we're talking about self-judgment and self-criticism, and we have the best person here with us to dive deep into the topic. Her name is Dr. Andrea Pennington. She's an integrative medical doctor and acupuncturist and the author of the Self-Love Handbook. I can't wait for you to hear what she has to say. If you're someone who is hypercritical on yourself, if you're someone who beats yourself up with your own thoughts, this podcast is for you. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Perowit, and each week my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and most importantly, live more. This week's guest is Dr. Andrea Pennington. Dr. Pennington is an integrative physician, acupuncturist, meditation teacher, number one international best-selling author, and TEDx speaker. With her extensive medical expertise and training in trauma recovery, combined with her experience in traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture, Dr. Andrea helps people to build resilience, reclaim vitality, and thrive despite the inevitable trauma and drama life brings. Fueled by her extensive study of age management medicine, plant-based nutrition, positive psychology, and neuroscience-inspired biohacking, Dr. Andrea leads a team of health professionals on the online media platform, Innate Vitality. She facilitates a variety of workshops around the world that promote holistic healing, resilience, trauma recovery, and self-love using brainwave training with EEG neurofeedback. Trauma-informed positive psychology, the attunement meditation, which we're going to be talking about in this podcast, yoga, breathwork, and sacred plant medicine ceremonies with qualified shamans. Dr. Andrea Pennington, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Drew. And I appreciate you. Uh, you know, we were originally going to shoot for recording this in person, and then everything happened with the coronavirus. So thanks for your flexibility in making this happen. And I look forward to going even deeper the next time that we can be in person and continue the conversation. So we, we brought you on the podcast today to talk about a number of themes. But one of the most important themes we wanted to talk about was the theme of self-love, which you've written about quite extensively, and addressing head-on this area of people having negative self-talk and being regularly hard on themselves. So I want to jump in and start off from the beginning. Before we go into your story, which I know you have a lot to say and a lot of experiences on self-love, I want to start with the state of the union on the current times. When you look what what the world is going through right now with the coronavirus, self-quarantine, and being in isolation for many of us, where do you think that self-criticism and self-love is coming in or not coming in during these times? Well, it's been quite a sticky journey for many people. First of all, just being in this confinement without the usual distractions that most people have, like work or going out to bars and these sorts of things, people have a lot more time on their hands with themselves, you know, especially those of us who are somewhat, uh, you know, not with a big, huge family. And there have been two, two trends that I've seen. One is some people, and I have to admit I'm one of them, some people who are introverts are not having a hard time <laughs> so much with this confinement because we're used to kind of hunkering down. And some of those people who are totally fine with having all this free time are being super productive. I've heard of people finishing their books, writing up new presentations, launching new online courses, like they're doing these artistic and creative projects that they've always dreamt of doing. And then there's this backlash. People are seeing other you know, online accounts and they're, guy, they're like thinking, oh my God, you're so productive. Like you're doing all this and that and this and that. And I'm over here stressed out, freaking out in so much uncertainty and overwhelm that the anxiety is too great. And so that's when people go into self-judgment. And some of them are certainly, you know, kind of medicating themselves with watching online TV shows and 
binge eating, but many of them are finding that this inner critic, this negative voice is creeping up and telling them, you know, you're a loser. Why aren't you doing what so-and-so is doing? Like, why can't you even control yourself from, you know, not binge eating? And so there is a lack of self-love that has probably already been there. It's just that people were able to distract themselves from that inner dialogue with work and other pursuits. Let's start at the beginning. Where does even that self-criticism and where does that self-judgment voice come from? You know, you have such an interesting intersection of being a physician and acupuncturist and having your whole world of integrative and traditional medicine and Chinese medicine. And you have all these modalities and philosophies that have influenced you combined with all the work that you do on brain health and plant medicine. I'm curious when somebody asks you, where does this voice come from? Where does self-judgment come from? What do you share with them? Well, I tell them that they weren't born with it, but it got constructed You know, all of these little voices, it's generally not just one, by the way, there are usually several who have different tones of voice and different language. They tend to be an amalgamation or an assembly of voices we've heard outside of us. So typically, once we start growing up, all of the influences of our childhood from our caretakers and parents and siblings to our peers, our teachers at school, the coaches, then of course, the media. All of these sort of impressions are impacting us. And so when we're, we're young, typically, if you've at least had a safe and comfortable household, you are typically kind of rambunctious and expressive until someone teases you or shames you or says that, you know, little girls don't do that. Big boys don't do that. And because our developing ego which is just a construct, is so tuned in to our survival. That ego starts to record those messages. Okay, if girls don't do that, then I'm never going to do that. And every time I want to do that, the ego and the brain are going to send us these warning signals like, "Uh uh-uh, you're either going to get punished or, or slapped or belittled again. And so it's a protective mechanism. You know, our ego doesn't want us to get kicked out of the tribe or the family. We want to be accepted. And so we incorporate these voices into our psyche and they come up later on in life. And of course, not everybody hears actual voices. It can sometimes just be a feeling like, you know, oh, I'm such an idiot. I don't find that everyone always has that voice, but they know that meaning of that kind of a script. Let's make this a little bit personal. I would love for you to share a little bit, you know, you I've heard you in another interview that you did with my business partner, Dr. Hyman, you said, you know, you had like, you didn't have an overly traumatic background. You know, I think sometimes people hear about this and are like, I had a great life. You know, my parents were fantastic. Or I never went through anything, you know, crazy that's out there. But I think part of what you're saying is that everybody, you know, it's all relative. Everybody, no matter, you don't have to have a, you know, intense upbringing, although that can be a part of it. It's just that all of humanity is going to go through some version of it. So actually, before I go to my question, let me ask that first part. Is this something that everybody goes through when they're growing up? Absolutely. And it can still happen in adulthood. We all incorporate some voice. Now, of course, you and I are talking about the negative, mean and critical voice, but you might have had really supportive parents, you know, or a great coach who encouraged you. So you may have an inner dialogue that says, oh, you can do this. You got it. You got it. Right. But for most of us, uh, for everyone else, yes, we have incorporated these voices from somewhere. Let's make this personal as I was going to get to before, but I kind of cut myself off. Let's talk about your life growing up. What were some of these voices that you heard in your own experiences? (laughs) Well, it's true. I didn't have a particularly traumatic experience, but... Um, because my parents were divorced and I was the youngest of three children, um, I was kind of always trying to get the approval and attention of my father. And because of how my father grew up, he had this belief that the only important thing in life is to get a good education and to get a good job and that sort of secure pension, you know, that was his, his paradigm. And so 
what I heard growing up is every time I wanted to play trumpet or I was in a new play at school or when I wanted to join the cheerleading squad, I had my dad's voice coming up like, oh, you know, you're a dilettante, just like your old dad, you know, you really need to focus. And so it wasn't particularly harsh. He, of course, was well-meaning. He wanted me to be successful in life. But it really ended up impacting me because every time I had an impulse to do something creative or I wanted to explore something new, I had that voice inside of me telling me that I was a dilettante and that's a bad thing, that I couldn't focus and that was a bad thing. And so, it, of course, I didn't go through life thinking, oh, I'm just a bad person until it got to the point that it was so overwhelming. I had developed kind of this, this compensation that said, okay, well, I have better make sure I'm doing so many other good things, you know, this perfectionism and always on this achievement track to try to compensate for any time I did something quote unquote bad, that it became overwhelming. And I felt like this literal weight on my shoulders uh, nearly constantly until my mid thirties. I mean, it sounds crazy to say, but I literally finally woke up to the fact that I didn't love myself. I was hating on myself with these different voices. You know, if you walk up, I always use this example. If you walk up to somebody on the street and you just ask them, you know, anywhere in, in the U.S. at least or most of the world, say, hey, do you eat pretty healthy? And most people would say, yeah, I think I'm pretty healthy, you know. And when you actually can maybe look at what they're eating and what they're doing, you might say, okay, health is a spectrum. And I think in the same way, it's like if you walk up to most people and say like, you know, hey, do you, do you love yourself? I think most people would say, yeah, I love myself. You know, they kind of write it off and they don't really ask themselves. So where did you realize, like, how did you actually know and really inquire within whether you actually loved yourself? Well, I actually didn't ask that question of myself the way that I found out I didn't love myself was in my medical practice. Um, about 20 years ago, when I first went into practice, I ended up um, focusing on a lot of addiction, eating disorders, and trauma work. Um, I got trained in this ear acupuncture technique and helping people through their addiction and binge eating and stuff. As we got them sort of stabilized and we're doing like the cognitive and behavioral stuff, what I noticed was there were some people who would like sabotage, like they'd get to a really good level of sobriety and, and other health parameters. And then they'd like trip up. And sometimes I'm like looking at them like, you, you know better. I know you're stronger. What's going on? And as we kind of talked it through and got under it, what I discovered is that there was certain patients who didn't feel like they were worth being happy or having success. They hmm. didn't love themselves. They didn't feel like they were valuable. And it was at that time that I was kind of like, just hearing some of the things they said, I was like, oh my God, I feel that way too. So I didn't have words to, to say, oh, I, Andrea, you're such a loser. I hate you. I, I hate myself. But once I heard these patients and why they were ending up trauma, you know, re-traumatizing themselves, that's what it was. It was a lack of self-love. There's a doctor here in Santa Monica, an integrative doctor named Dr. Edison uh, DeMello, and he says, the first question I always ask my patient when they come in is, do they believe they can get healthy? Because if they don't believe that they can get healthy, we have to first start there before we go down the pathway of what protocol, supplements, testing, and everything else that they move forward with. And I think it's so fascinating because a lot of times we don't actually know that that narrative is running in the background, just as you were saying, you had to see it in somebody else. So I want to I want to go to your story. And I asked you a little about life growing up. You were talking about this acupuncture experience. Uh, you had shared in a previous interview that um, your, your mother was a big influence of introducing you into integrative modalities. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yes. My mother has always been this, <laughs> this rebel in the family. Um, God bless her. It was interesting because she, um, in the nineties, the right in the heyday of the crack cocaine epidemic, she was the medical director for Georgia mental health Institute. Um, 
which is in Atlanta. And she, as part of her role as a medical director, she had to do all this sort of um, continuing education. And she was, of course, overseeing the ward where people would come in with addictions and overdoses and such. And she was offered this training program for treatment uh, of addiction using auricular, that's ear, acupuncture. And I remember at the time hearing her, I was in medical school at the time uh, at Wash U in St. Louis, and she was telling me how these women in her practice who were addicted to crack cocaine, who were pregnant or had just delivered their babies, they were coming into this treatment program as outpatients, and she was detoxing them. And at the time, I was like, that is inhumane. You can't even do that. You know, I had just done my psych rotation and seen people in the hospital hooked up to IVs, getting fluids and all this supportive care. I'm like, you can't do that as an outpatient. They need to be in the hospital so they can be supported. And she's like, no, the acupuncture is doing it. And I went home uh, to visit her over Thanksgiving break. And I was like, I want to experience these needles. Like what's going on? Because there's nothing in them. You're not injecting any medicine or anything. So she put in these needles and set me in this room, turned down the lights, and I had the wildest sort of rush of energy. And then I felt this flood of emotion and tears running down my face. And I was like, what, how is that even possible? These few little needles stuck in these little tiny points? Well, I went back to my, my medical school and I you know, begged the dean to let me go and do this training. And I went to the Bronx in New York and did a rotation there where I put in over a hundred treatments and watched people detox before my very eyes. And it was that experience that opened me up to realize that there is more to healing than meets the eye. And to your point about this belief, like, do you believe you can heal? And do you believe you're worthy of healing? I started to see that being repeated. So I was running this wellness center and we would get referrals from other people and we would refer people to other doctors. And I talked to this holistic dentist and I said, hey, I've got this patient. You know, you have to understand they've been addicted to pain meds in the past. So I'm really trying to help them find a dentist who can either do this root canal or take out the teeth or whatever is going to need to happen. And as he was looking at their x-rays and all of that, he said, well, does this patient even believe and I was kind of like, you know, at that point in my career, I was like, really? You're down like that? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, because if we, for example, decided to do implants, if they're too afraid or they don't believe, the, their body will not take the implant. So I, I was being exposed to this as very young, you know, as a physician early in my career and recognizing that we have to take into consideration the mind, the body, what, what in Chinese medicine we call the spirit our environment, our beliefs, all of that impacts our ability to heal. When you think about that initial moment that you had when your uh, mother had introduced you to the, to the needles, to acupuncture, and that transformative experience, how would you explain what happened to both your body and your spirit? And did your mom help you at the time to give you context for like what actually was happening. As you said, you weren't injecting anything in your body. You weren't putting anything. There's nothing actually that's going in. So what was actually happening that you think led to the feelings that you had at that time and the release that you had at that time? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. My mother, the language that she used as she was trained, she was talking in Chinese terms, like, okay, you've just felt that rush. That is the movement of qi. When the qi engages and you get this sort of rush, that's what's happening in, in sort of the Vedic or India or yogic traditions, we would say a Kundalini experience. But I was so, you know, fixed on science. When I went back to med school, I was like, I need to understand this. And I got lucky because at that time, there was actually a consensus conference being held at the NIH. So once again, I begged my dean, let me go to this consensus conference. I flew to DC, to Maryland, and I did attend. And there, that's when I found out all of these research studies that showed that by placing the needles, 
Yes, you will feel a local reaction. You might feel a, a pinch. But what we know is that injecting these needles at very specific points can um, stimulate these mu opioid receptors along the spinal cord, cord. And that's what mediates the pain relief, for example. Um, that rush of energy, when we know that all of these nerves are connected, you know, the vagus nerve runs from the brain to the brain stem all the way down to the gut. And so that rush that people feel in their stomach coming up to their heart well, that's how it's being mediated by activating these nerve fibers. And in terms of the emotional release, again, we kind of have to go back to the Chinese model. We know that when we're stimulating you know, things like the heart or this um, parasympathetic, it creates this sort of bonding and relaxation effect. And so that is how the science and the Chinese medical system would explain what I experienced. Let's look at the concept that we started off the podcast with, which is self-criticism, self-judgment, being hard on ourselves. When we are in this mental loop, in our default neural network in our brain, what is happening to our body? What are we doing to our body from a chi level? If we look through the lens of, of Chinese medicine or or another modality like Ayurvedic medicine where it understands the energies in the body. So we're, when we're in that mental loop, when we're thinking those thoughts, when we're stuck there, what's actually happening to our body? Well, any stressful thought, including self-criticism, is going to trigger the stress response. So our brain is going to you know, send out these fight or flight chemicals, even if the attack is from ourselves. And so from an energetic perspective, when we know that those neurochemicals and hormones are flooding through the system, it creates a chain reaction. So the energy that we feel in the body, you might call that butterflies in your stomach or knots in your stomach. That energy, depending on your energy type, it might affect you more in your muscles. So for example, in Chinese medicine, we have these five different energies. You know, you've got your wood, water, fire, uh, metal and earth energies. And each of us has our own particular profile. You know, we have, there are all five that will impact you in various ways, but you may have two or three that are more dominant. So for me, if I'm under stress, if I'm in this panic because of this coronavirus, or I'm feeling my freedom is being limited because I've got to be in this confinement, the way that that, that stress response gets transmitted differently in me, for example. I have a lot of wood element in my profile, so I do feel the muscle tension, and I do feel this emotional unrest, like I, I need to be free, I need to be able to move, and that's how it impacts. So it's really interesting when you start to look at, it is one stress response, like everyone's brain will go through the same process, unless you are already zen and you're like, okay, I'm just not going to freak out. But when everyone gets triggered based on the threat that we're experiencing, that flood of chemicals is going to influence your body based on your energetic profile in a different way. Let's go back to your story. And you had shared that you had seen this in other individuals, this idea of self-sabotage or feeling like they weren't enough. And that's why they might not finish the treatment or continue with the therapy, even if they were making great progress on their journey. And you saw that reflection in you that there wasn't that full level of self, self-love that was there. Um, what did you do from there? How did your journey continue? What did you decide to explore next? Well, I knew that I had to go deeper because if we were giving these people psychotherapy, which I was also doing for myself, they were getting exercise, they were getting good nutrition, they were working through their issues with their family, and they weren't healing. What I discovered, you know, through more uh, training is there's a, a somatic component, meaning there's a body component and there's this inner child component or this, you know, a more tender young version of ourselves. So it led me down the path of looking at EMDR and tapping and um, somatic experiencing uh, and even hypnotherapy, because on the one hand, if someone had been teased or bullied or even abused as a child, even though we were sitting there with their rational mind saying, listen, 
your dad, he's gone. There's no threat. Their adult rational mind got it. You can get it intellectually like, oh, this is really not a big deal. But there is this wounded inner child that has to be addressed. And by going in, whether it's through meditation, we use a life writing journal process, hypnotherapy, and uh, even expressive therapy like psycho, psychodrama. When you allow these parts of the, the psyche to be acknowledged, to be validated for their, their feelings, then you can step in and give more compassion and comfort so that you can invite that part of you to step forward, to step up to the level of maturity that we are today and even a bit of the rationality. But trying to, to rationalize or reason with your inner child won't work because believe it or not, that inner child, the, the you that, that was bullied at age five or was abused at age 10 or what have you, that level of psychological development is still active. So you have to actually go back and do the repair um, at the emotional level and cognitive level that you were then. And so that's what I started to study. And of course, we in the Western world, we do have all of these wonderful techniques that I've just mentioned. But what was interesting was I was exposed to something called trance dance, which was sort of my first exposure into different shamanic and um, sort of indigenous practices. And I found that there are cultures around the world that have a modality or several modalities to help people sort of get rid of that faulty programming that unfortunately many of us in the West, we just don't have. So that's what I started to explore both for myself and later, it was much later that I introduced it to my patients because at first I thought they would think I was cuckoo. But after I experienced it for myself, that's when I started to incorporate it into my retreats. When someone's looking for the right modality that they can explore that could help them unpack some of this, you know, you just mentioned a whole bunch of things. You mentioned hypnotherapy, trance dance, uh, and, and I know there's a bunch of others that you've ex explored and experimented with. How would you recommend, when you recommend to people today to find, it's kind of like a puzzle, you have to find the right little fit on the other side for you. How do you recommend to people today on finding that and exploring that pathway and staying staying open to the fact that it may take some time to find the right modality for you to help unpack, as you said, some of the old stuff from you know growing up and that inner child? So Drew, I'm just going to tell you for a quick second here. It's eight o'clock and this is the hour that everyone goes out to the balcony and bangs on pots and pans and cheers and claps for the healthcare and frontline workers. Yeah, so no, I don't that's know if great. you can hear that. I can hear, it, I can hear it lightly and let's keep it in. You know, it's real. It's like, it's authentic. It's this is like, we're dealing with quarantine and this is what people are doing. Exactly. So usually and me and my awesome daughter. are celebrating that. Right? How, it, celebrating it, healthcare workers. It is. And and the other people, the, the people who are still working at the bakery and the totally. bus drivers. Bus drivers. And, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we are very, very grateful. So just in case you could hear it. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So to get back to your question, how would I recommend someone explore some of these modalities? Well, first you have to kind of understand my thinking process. What I learned through studying Chinese medicine is that each of us has an innate vitality code. In other words, the body knows how to repair itself. The body has its own mechanism of returning to homeostasis. And with that understanding, then I can say to you that you know how, even if you're not conscious of it, you know how to heal. And on the emotional side, and getting back to your essential self, your soul knows the way. And the way that the, the emotional self will know what treatment is right for it is you'll feel a sense of resonance. So either, as I'm mentioning one of these therapies, you, you'll kind of feel like, hmm, I'm, I'm curious, what did she just say? Or you'll feel something in your body that says, oh, I, I want to explore that. Or you'll get this sort of cognitive 
knowing that, oh, I've heard that before. Now this is maybe the fifth time. Maybe I should at least explore. So what I typically do is I will share. I mean, I have, of course, I'm, I've I got some expertise after all these years. If I'm sitting with someone, I can tell from their energy profile what would probably be helpful, and then I can suggest it. But it's always good for us to tune in with our intuition. And I know that you're a big believer in, in the, the gut, heart, and brain axis. And we're so much more intelligent and aware than we give ourselves credit for. But I invite people to really tune into that. And as you're hearing some of these modalities where you start to do research, trust that inner knowing that says, yeah, this might be the way for me to go. So part of it, if I zoom out and I look at how you're explaining this for our audience, the first part is that these self-critical thoughts and voices, they're not us. They're just things that we might have inherited from growing up, from society, you know, sources outside of us, experiences, being teased, being bullied on the critical side. They could be coming from anywhere, but it's not our true voice. Now, as adults, which most people listening to this podcast are adults, there could be a whole host of things that we could do to help counterbalance that. And along with it, if we don't get back to the root of it, which is core things that probably most likely developed when we were younger at the basis of our our brain development, at the basis of our identity development, at the basis of our ego development, if we don't use some modalities to explore that, it's hard to really get to the root of what's happening. And then to look for those modalities, we're really stepping into the place of what resonates with us. What are we naturally drawn towards? We feel excited to pick up this book. Oh, we heard somebody say something about acupuncture again for the third time this week or ecstatic dance that's there. Let me go and follow my heart, follow my bliss, as Joseph Campbell says, to go down that pathway. Is is that a, a, a good summary of what we've talked about so far? Yes, it's excellent. And, and all I would add is that what came for me in working with these patients and then working with myself what I discovered is there's actually a natural flow and progression to learning who you really are and then learning to love yourself and then living as your authentic self. And that process uh, is, is what I've included in my, my most recent book, The Real Self-Love Handbook. So it's a five-step now proven process for helping you identify who you really are. And we start by doing exactly what you said, it's really identifying how did you get programmed in the first place? Like where is the source or the origin of these beliefs? And how do we sort of debug your mental computer? How do we reprogram the subconscious mind and allow what I call the soul print to determine who you really are and live from your essence? So I found that even when I looked at other cultures, and what, whether they went on a shamanic journey or a rite of passage journey, I found that people were going through these very same repeatable five steps to learn who they are, to love who they are, and to live who they are. Mm, that's powerful. I, I want to talk about, you know, sometimes you see this meme online. It's People have posted on Facebook and Instagram and other social media out there like Twitter. And, it, and it'll show like uh, the true journey. Um, and it's depicted in different ways. So imagine an iceberg, right? We know that above the water, there's only part of the iceberg. And then below the water is the vast majority of the weight and the mass of an iceberg. And it's all the, um, it, it's the majority of the masses underneath it. And so you'll see some memes sometimes that say on the top, we see something like, you know, self-love or somebody finding their authentic voice or somebody who has some version of feeling like they have life figured out for them. But underneath, we don't often see all the things that they had to do, all the zigs and zags that were in their journey of figuring out who they were. So in your journey, you've been very open about the fact that you've gone through your own zigs and zags, just like we all do as humanity. And I would like to come back to your story to talk a little bit about that. So after understanding and expo exploring a little bit with some of these um, modalities, from the outside, you achieved what a lot of people would say is a, a pretty strong level of success. You're on TV, you had um, the financial uh, 
and the societal accolades that were there, but there was still some part of you that felt like something was was missing. Can you share more about your journey um, from that context? Yes, I. So I I definitely grew up loving the arts and the creative expression side of things, and even at university I was doing. Uh, community theater. And then I got pulled into TV production and I was the general manager of our TV station at Georgia State. But I had always heard that message that, you know, none of that can be relied on and it's frivolous. So I decided to follow in my mother's footsteps and go to medical school. And coming out of med school, I went into the hospital situation and it was intense. You know how that works. It's like working 80 to hundred hours a week and you're around sick people and there's all this bureaucracy and I was miserable and I couldn't wait to get out. But then when I got out, I happened to be, um, I guess it was fortunate. Um, I was recruited by discovery, um, to be the medical director of discovery health channel, which was really wonderful. Um, I was at least able to do more of the creative stuff and still relying on my medical brain. And that's when I created my wellness center. But there came a moment where I realized that who I was being on TV and who I was being in my private life wasn't matching up. And I was starting to feel the weight of that, um, mainly because I had already always been sort of programmed to try to fit in these boxes. So even with the, you know, for example, with the medical community, when I opened that wellness center, the people in the DC area said things like, don't you think you should be opening this in California where all the woo woo doctors are? And so I felt this judgment like, oh, they don't think that this is credible or what have you. And even when I was on television, uh, I would want to share some of the insights that I was getting, but they were like, yeah, that just sounds weird. So I was feeling like there was this disconnect between what I was experiencing as my truth versus what I had to show up as, as this personal brand in the media. And that got very, very heavy because with all of the success and the money and the stuff, I had this weighty, very heavy responsibility to keep it going, to keep my employees paid and all of that sort of thing. And it little by little, that sense of unrest started to manifest as depression and anxiety. And I got to a point where I literally was just struggling to get through each day. You know, I'd have to put on that happy mask and go do the news or go do a show. And it got to the point where I just didn't want my life anymore. And that sort of desperation is also what fueled a lot of this searching and searching. And it was through all of this sort of a quest that I kind of gave up on life. And I happened to be on vacation in France, trying to run away from the success. And I happened to reconnect, as as you've heard before, I reconnected with that artistic passion of singing. And as I was on stage and just feeling this sense of bliss, I just felt like I was completely my true self. I felt loved and I didn't even know to put words on it, but I, I felt like I loved myself. And it was in going back to my hotel and waking up the next day, I was like, what was that? How could I have experienced such bliss? And as I realized that I would have to return to that confining, constricting box in a couple of days returning to America, that's when I lost it. And I cried out to God and asked God to take my life. And it was then that I had this out-of-body experience that really, um, it rocked my world. I reconnected with my higher self and I was shown from this sort of spiritual perspective on the other side exactly who I really am as a spiritual being and exactly why I was depressed. You know, I, I saw kind of that life review that a lot of people talk about. I saw this life review. I saw my every decision that was made, even though they weren't conscious decisions, I was kind of just forced or like a little sheep going with the herd. Every decision I made was a logical end. My logical endpoint was there in depression and anxiety. And it was that seeing that and that understanding of okay, what are you saying then? You're saying that I could have chosen differently. I get to choose who I am. Um, and that's when I was willing to say yes to life. And I, I saw a vision of a future that, it, that did inspire me. 
And that's when I came back into my body and the depression was gone. The anxiety was gone. And that feeling of self-love that remained. I didn't understand it, but I was like, this has got to be something that I live by for the rest of my life. You know, there's that quote from the Course in Miracles and a few other places it's attributed to, but it says, what you resist will persist. What you accept, you transform, or what you accept, you go beyond. In that moment of awakening that you had, what do you think it was that you were resisting? What was the resistance, the be- the belief? What was the thing that was keeping you from who you already were and are? It was resisting self-expression that I had learned through my childhood. I didn't feel free to express myself. I felt judged every time I wanted to. It was resisting being true to my own voice. And that's what I had resisted. I had always tried to fit in to get my father's approval and then to get the medical approval and then the media approval. And in doing that, trying to fit into all those boxes, I was denying my true self, my own voice and my own expression. And once I saw that experience and had those experiences, it it was just very clear to me that we're all meant to come to this planet to live out our own particular destiny. And even though our parents, they mean well, and I know my father meant well, but I'm here to live my own destiny, just as you are. We're not meant to be copycats. We're not meant to be sheep. And once I saw that, that was, that was the turning point for me to transcend, to go beyond those feelings and to embrace my authentic self. You know, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because most of the time, even the people that become some version of a voice in our head, they do mean well, and they're trying to navigate. And in many times they think that they're doing the right thing. They're saving us or they're protecting us from some sort of pain or other aspect uh, that, that we would go through. They don't want us to go through that. But then on the other side of it, it can kind of put some boxes in. I know that for me, Um, I I was born in Nairobi, Kenya, in Africa, and my family is a fourth generation uh, Kenyans. And my dad, the day that I was born, I've shared this story before with our podcast listeners, but the day that I was born, there was a coup attempt in Mm -hmm. Nairobi. And my mom had to give birth to me in the basement of the hospital. My dad wasn't allowed in the hospital. And he was at home worried, sick about us. Are we okay? Are we not okay? Luckily, the coup didn't end up happening But for four days, the government was on national lockdown. Nobody knew what was going on. And in that time period, you know, my my dad said, okay, it's it's time for us to move. And I want to be in America with our family. And one of the things that helped him get out of Kenya sooner and faster to create a better future for his family was he had an MBA and he had an advanced degree and he had accelerated up the corporate ladder and that sort of stuff. And I know that a lot of my dad's emphasis on school, on education, and wanting to do things a particular way came from his own pain that he went through and wanting me not to go through that pain. So when I wanted to pursue a different career, be an entrepreneur, drop out of college to start my first company, that brought up a lot of feelings for him. But if I actually took a step back and I looked at it, which much later on I was able to, I could see that you know he was just coming from the best place that he could and my dad is very supportive. He's one of the biggest supporters of my life. And, you know, I'm so thankful for the childhood that I had. But I'm glad that you added that into it about your father because I think of us, you know, this story with my dad too is that these people in our lives that often we can feel boxed in at certain points, if we actually applied self compassion to them and asked what were they going through that led to this we don't necessarily have to agree with them. We might even have completely different opinions than they did of how people should be parented or how we should treat people or talk to people, but we could understand them and in a way take away the power that that voice has in our head. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. I had not heard that part of your story and you're absolutely right. Compassion is what we need, whether it's for our parents and caregivers, the people who meant well, or just didn't have the coping skills. And we also need that for ourselves today. And it's interesting that you bring up um, having the government on lockdown during that potential coup attempt. There are many people who are feeling incredibly triggered right now, who don't realize that there may be something in their past 
that has primed their nervous system to be even more sensitive. Now, this may not be in the case of you. Hopefully you were, you know, nestled in safety and security. But many people, if they experience some sort of trauma um, or early on in the pregnancy or in early on in, in their lives, their nervous system has been put on hyper alert such that they're hyper vigilant in some cases. And then when you get to the situation like coronavirus, it's causing people to have so much more anxiety. And so one of the things that I heard when people were feeling like, dude, this doesn't make sense. Why am I still on edge? Like I've gotten into a routine. There's enough toilet paper for everyone. Why do I still feel this way? And when you look at some people who experience these adverse childhood experiences, or they are um, descendants of people who experienced genocide or war or Holocaust and so on, we recognize that there's this tweaked nervous system. And the, the antidote is to bring in compassion. Like we've got to be compassionate to ourselves to say, yeah, maybe you are a little more uh, anxious than other people. But based on what you've lived or what you may have inherited, you deserve compassion. And that was the biggest, that was actually the hardest thing for me, <laughs> because even though I'd had this out of body experience, like some people say, oh, well, it's easy for you. You, you went over to the other side. You met God. Of course, you're going to just come back and be in bliss. But I still came back and had that ego and those voices telling me you haven't done enough. You're not good enough. What if, what if? And so that was, it was the, the self-compassion meditation and this practice that really saves me every time I feel that little twinge. So I would definitely invite uh, your listeners to practice that. Can you uh, describe, um, actually, I'm going to ask you a question before I ask the second part, which is to describe what the self-compassion meditation is and how people can do it. Sometimes there's this belief in society that, um, we've accomplished. I know a lot of very successful individuals feel, at least the ones that, you know, you look at outward success, societal success, career, financial, whatever it might be, driven in education. Sometimes there's a belief that they internally have, which is they accomplish so much because they were hard on themselves. So two-part question. Number one, did you ever have that belief that the reason that you were so driven and motivated was because you were so hard on yourself early on or that because you were hard on yourself that pushed you to go and accomplish and go get that dream job at Discovery or get the accolades in medical school um, and in your education? And um, two, uh, if you were working with somebody who has that belief, how do you help them unpack it? Well, in my case, I was definitely programmed to go for achievement. And, you know, whether it was getting good grades or making sure that, you know, everything that I was supposed to do was done, not only on time, but early, that started in childhood. And then, of course, going to a, a pretty intense research oriented medical school, it was reinforced. So I had this incessant drive to make sure I knew enough, I knew more, I did more. That got programmed very early on, and that's what drove me to achievement. There's, there, was a, there was a moment, though, I should, I should say. I did realize, probably somewhere in my teenage years, that even if I didn't get straight A's, my dad would still love me. I'd still have his attention. But by then, it had become such an ingrained habit that it persisted all the way to my 30s. And so it wasn't because I was hard on myself. It was because I was programmed. And that program led me to continue to be harder and harder on myself. Um, and it, that, I think that's why it was so hard to practice compassion. But I definitely had this moment when I started learning about mindfulness and meditation and, and doing work with these Chinese masters. It did make me wonder if I did back off, if those voices were quieter and more loving, would I become like a doormat and let people just walk all over me? Would I stop achieving stuff? Would I just kind of chill? And actually, no, it, it's quite the opposite. You get tuned in to what you're really here to do. And then all of your drive or motivation is just directed at living your truth and your destiny. So you may not be overachieving anymore, but that's okay. It's not like that was um, ideal for you anyway. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it totally does. You know, it's like there's this belief that if we 
stop doing that, then we're going to lose our edge. But actually a whole other part of our creativity and, and brain opens up when we don't use just that one tool that was in our toolbox um, that, that we often inherited from somewhere else. So I want to come back to it because part of this and part of letting things go is just bringing self-compassion. Whether somebody's done the work to understand how their childhood or upbringing or early adulthood has impacted them now or whether they haven't, the go-to is that if we were just a little bit kinder to ourselves, then we could at least um, not continue the pattern at the same strength. So talk to us about the self-compassion meditation exercise and how somebody could learn about it and, and practice it. Well, self-compassion is just the wish that you not suffer. So it, it traces back um, the particular practice that I'll share with you is reciting four phrases. And it traces back to something called the loving kindness meditation, which comes from a, a, a Pali word, which is metta. And metta is the loving kindness that a mother would have for her tiny little baby. It's that feeling that we have when we see a cute little puppy or a little duck. And we're like, oh, I just want that, that, that little being to, to be happy, to be safe, to be healthy, to be free from suffering. And when we tune into self-compassion, what we're really doing is just recognizing our own humanity, that everyone goes through this drama and trauma with this programming of the ego and trying to fit in. And by having self-compassion, you're basically tuning into the awareness that you're not the voice. You said this earlier, you're not that mean voice. You're not your mistakes. You're not even your body. You are the consciousness that animates that body. And when you start to tune into compassion and you wish yourself, you, you literally say, may I be truly happy. May I be free from suffering. May I be truly well in body, mind, and heart. And may I live peacefully and with ease. And I remember the first time I started saying those, those meditations as I was you know, sitting there and doing this breath work, once again, I had this rush of emotion and just tears streaming down my face. Because it was almost like the first time that I was speaking to my inner child and to my true self, that you deserve to be happy. You deserve to be free from suffering. You deserve to live with ease and peace, not all of this striving and looking for achievement and approval and validation. And it's a very strange thing because people think that, how could just reciting those phrases work? But it does. We, this is one of the, I know you already know this, but this is for, the, for anyone who hasn't heard, the loving kindness or the compassion meditation is one of the most clinically studied meditations out there. So a lot of people do breath work and there have been yoga studies and transcendental meditation. But this metta or loving kindness meditation has been clinically studied with people with addiction, with borderline personality disorders, with depression and anxiety. And what's been shown is that when you hook someone's brain up, for example, as they are meditating on compassion for themselves or for others, you know, one of the practices that we do is we take that feeling, that desire for non-suffering and we send it out to other people. And what happens is we see that default mode network of the brain shut down, as you were talking about early, earlier, and that's that ego, that chatter, that, that snarky little voice. It quiets down. And the parts of our brain that are associated with happiness, like the left prefrontal cortex, it gets engaged. And we see that people actually experience health benefits, like lower blood pressure, lower um, uh, cortisol levels lower anger and outbursts, improvements in their depression and anxiety. And so it's interesting that all of these things happening in the brain and happening on a psychological level, we can do for ourselves. Mm, powerful. I know you have a number of guided meditations and resources that are out there. Is the compassion meditation one of the things that people uh, can find? That, uh, is that one of the guided meditations you offer? Yes, I invite people to take a 21 day challenge because <laughs> it is challenging in the beginning. Um, if you visit my website, you'll see you can sign up to receive 
a guided meditation with some nice peaceful music and a quote, an inspiring quote about compassion for the day. And every day for 21 days, you med meditate right along with me and people around the world. And they're very short. You know, this is the other benefit that the studies show that between eight and 12 minutes, we can actually impact our brain in as little as eight days. So most of mine, I've tried to keep them around eight minutes so that if you are a beginning meditator, you can just listen, do the guided meditation and experience the benefits. And it's really remarkable what happens for people as they do this for 21 days. M most people end up carrying it over. And what it happens uh, on a practical level is the inner critic gets replaced with this inner compassionate figure. And it brings so much healing to us over the long term. Right now in quarantine, one of the unique challenges that are there is that uh, people, the, the beautiful thing is there are so many individuals that, that are thriving and are getting more quality time and family time and just enjoying the beauty of that. And some people that are getting more family time than they ever have had. And if they, and they've had a family for a long period of time, there's other situations where, uh, you're not just working on your own mental health in quarantine, but you're also navigating the mental health of the people around you. And one of the topics you had brought up to our team initially that we want to just touch on a little bit during these times is your concern for children um, who are in a place right now who are absorbing the stress and the fear of their parents and what's shown on the media and them not having the healthy coping mechanisms um, or it's not being modeled at home. What, what should parents be considering if they want to be stepping into a better place for uh, being that model or creating um, a better environment for the children at home? That's, that's an excellent question. I'm glad we get to address it because some, some children are finding that their parents who have lost their jobs uh, or lost their businesses if those parents are super stressed and don't have a, a natural coping ability, then that stress can be transmitted to everyone around them, including the children. And we've also seen, as I'm sure you're aware, there are increased cases of domestic violence and child abuse happening because these adults are really struggling with being in confinement. And so as we're thinking about compassion, if we can model that for ourselves and with our children, we can start to help them build up what I call resilience muscles. Because of course, it's going to be stressful for everyone. It, I mean, it, as much as I practice this stuff, it was, it was a big shift for me as well. But my go-to coping strategy is meditation. And over the years, being able to model that for my daughter has been amazing because I can see her now when something comes up, she doesn't go into the typical tizzy that I have seen other children. But we do have to model that. And if we can focus on that, then this doesn't have to be the precursor to PTSD. Now, it seems like in America, you guys are starting to um, potentially get out of quarantine. We here in France, uh, as of May 11th, you know, so not much longer, they're saying that children will be able to go to school in, in sort of split categories. So it's only lasted a couple of months. Hopefully, there won't be any lasting effects. But if you've been in a household where there have been unhealthy coping mechanisms or a lack of coping altogether with drugs or alcohol or you know, tense and abusive language, then those children their little brains, just like we've been talking about de the developing ego, their brain and their psyche is taking that on. And that means that the risk of, it's not for everyone, I'm not trying to make, make it sound like every kid is going to end up with PTSD, but there will be an imprint based on what they experienced and the caregivers. The best thing that can happen for anyone, even if you did experience trauma somewhere in your life, the reason that people that I saw in my medical practice, trapped emotion in their body, kept returning to food or drugs, and couldn't get to the full point of their recovery was because they didn't have a compassionate, responsible adult, doesn't always have to be your parent, but they needed someone to help process that energy and emotion and to compassionately be present 
as they voiced what happened to them, to be seen, to be validated, to be believed, so that that part of their psyche could move on. And that's what I think we, we really need to be mindful of today, to just you know snuggle up with your kids and let them know, yeah, I feel it too. I'm with you in this, but we're going to get through it together. And you know, would you like to meditate with me? Can we send wishes of compassion to ourselves or to, to our pets or to the people out there who are isolated and are really struggling? This is all possible for us. Mm. I love that. And such an important message. On the other side of, you know, if you suspect or already kind of knew that somebody's family situation was intense or dicey, you know, there's a lot of people that might have family members or friends that they know that the person that they're related to is a little unhinged or does not have, you know, even if there's not physical abuse and sometimes there could be physical abuse and obviously that has to be reported and, you know, dealt with appropriately. But if you suspect that there's a family that's there, that there might just be intense emotional abuse or a heaviness, what, what's the best way to navigate not just during these times, but in general, uh, of approaching being a difference or being a f- being a positive force for a family that's in that situation. The number one thing is to reach out and connect and talk, because most people, if they are in in a, a scary situation, if there's been abuse or there have been threats, sometimes they won't reach out for help. And so if you suspect that that could be going on with a loved one or a family member, reach out. You don't have to sit there and and accuse or, you know, ask and pry, but showing concern and care and being a non-judgmental listener and not just doing it once, but checking in regularly, just checking in so that there is this kind, caring presence in there. And then perhaps somebody will recognize that you're not being judgmental and they'll let it out. Like, you know what? I'm really struggling here and I just lost my cool and I did whatever I did. And then you can maybe suggest that they reach out for professional help. And all of the hotlines are fortunately fully staffed, you know, whether it's domestic abuse or child abuse or suicide, all of the prevention hotlines are available. So, but what we can do for the people that we care about, if you suspect it, Don't be silent. You don't have to pry, but just calling and repeatedly calling and repeatedly checking in will help. And we know that one of the other sort of reasons that people don't get well is because they they feel shame. It's a lot of people feel shame if they've grown up in a family that wasn't like everyone else's, where there was abuse or there was absenteeism or alcoholism. And sometimes people feel guilt. They feel like, well, I, it's my fault. I was too loud or I was too much. And so they won't tell anyone else. And, you know, there's this old saying in the 12 step program, we're only as sick as our secrets. And so if people are keeping secrets, that means they're bottling up all of that energy. And again, to get back to the Chinese system, we know that that energy, the energy that typically flows through our bodies and through the earth, it needs to flow. And if we're blocking it, if we're not using our voice, if we're not expressing ourselves and our needs and our desires and our boundaries, then that energy ends up going inward. And that's what can eventually lead to dis-ease in some form or another. Mm, very powerful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, so much of, of setting up our mindset for the best position and best place it can be in is really putting a lot of emphasis on the first few hours of our of our day and how we wake up because i often find that for myself um is how i start the morning sets the tone for the the rest of the day are are there practices of stepping into self compassion or stepping away from being hard on ourselves or self judgment that we can incorporate in the morning or even things that you might do for yourself that protect your brain, protect your mind, put boundaries around it and let you step into the intention that you want to create for the day. Absolutely. I am a big believer in morning routines and I'm a big believer in starting your day with you in mind and 
if you're a parent and you have to take care of kids right away, I suggest that you wake up 10 minutes earlier so that you have some me time. Starting the day with breath work or doing the compassion meditation, journaling is another big favorite of mine, where you really tune in to say, what do I want to experience for the day? And that sets your intention. What do I want to feel today? And you set that intention. What do I want to express today? And you set that intention. And by doing either breath work or yoga or this kind of meditation in the first 10 minutes of your day, not reaching over to the phone, not checking email or social media, but really having this time that you dedicate to yourself, over time, you will learn to come from that space of those intentions that are centered on you living as your best self with those best um, wishes for yourself and for everyone that you come into contact with. So that's what I do. Every morning I wake up and before I interact with anyone, and I've trained my daughter so she knows that this is my magical time for me to do my journal work and my meditation and chanting so that I set the tone uh, for the rest of my day and my life. Part of being human is naturally things get out of balance and that could be a good thing. You know, sometimes we have to work a little bit more because we have a deadline for a book or it's a little bit more intense in our business or we're taking care of a family member. So we can't have the same, you know, routine that we want to. And what a lot of our past podcast guests have talked about is just catching ourselves, catching ourselves when we're in that position, applying self-compassion and just saying, okay, when I get the next chance, I'm going to get back into routine. Now, now the hard part for a lot of people is catching themselves and finding those sort of leading indicators that are an example that we are a little bit more out of balance than we normally are. I'm curious for you, uh, um, Dr. Andrea, what are some of the things and what are the signposts that you look for in your life on, on a personal level that are an indication that you might have gotten a little bit more out of balance? I can tell when I'm being unconscious. <laughs> so, for example, the way that that manifests is me being snappy or irritable. So I know that if I'm in balance, if I've taken care of myself and looked after my needs, and definitely if I've gotten my meditation in, then I'm much more flexible in my attitude. And if someone has a demand or a request or my, my kids popping up and want something, I won't snap. I'm in my present and rightful mind. Um, and I've learned that, of course, over time by recognizing, oh, when I'm edgy, I get this tension in my jaw or my, or my shoulders, and I'm, I'm more irritable. It's much faster for me to just react and say something in a very snotty tone of voice. Now, that's what happens in me. But you mentioned something about chaos and change. And it's true that there are going to be times in our lives where, where change is, well, I mean, there's, change is the only constant, right? Everything is impermanent. And one of the things that I recognized with resilience, besides compassion and having tolerance, we have to tune into this resilience trait of flexibility and adaptability so that when we recognize, oh, okay, I did just snap. Okay, I realize it's because I didn't get up early because I was working late. I'm super exhausted. We've got to have that compassion to say, all right, let me be adaptable and not get hard on myself saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that. You should have, should have, should have. Because putting all that should on us weighs us down. So, you know, there, there are these resilience traits that all of us, if we're aware of them, as soon as you find yourself slipping into rigidity, in my case, that's what happens, then I know, oh, what's the opposite of that? Well, the resilience trait would be flexibility and adaptability. Oh, okay. Let me let me practice that a little bit more. Hmm. That's great. That's really great advice. Dr. Andrea Pennington, this has been an incredible conversation, and I'm sure there's so much for us to continue talking about in round two, which I'm putting out the vibes and the intention for that that can happen in person. Um, I just love in-person interviews, and this was great too, but it's like it's always nice to pick up the energetic uh uh, vibes of somebody else and to share that uh, experience in person. Um, I want to acknowledge you and thank you for coming on the podcast to talk about this important subject, subject which is so relevant uh, today. We would love to talk about you know some of the books and offerings. You have, you've built this incredible empire um, of 
retreats, which I'm sure might be on hold for a little bit, but there's plenty of other resources that are out there. Uh, can you share a little bit about the world that you've created and some of the resources that are there for our guests? Yeah, absolutely. So through the course of this finding my voice and uh, self-expression, um, I started a media and publishing agency. And one of the books that we released in January, who knew we were going to need it so much, is the top 10 traits of highly resilient people. And it's me and 20 other authors from around the world sharing stories of how they've overcome challenges, both physical, emotional, and financial challenges. And they've emerged not only to survive, but to thrive, and they're stronger. And finding these 10 traits of resilience has been like a, a real lifesaver for me because it's it's allowed me to weather the storms of life and not break, but it's given me a way to teach other people how to do the same. So that's one book that um, if someone is looking for some quarantine reading, you can tune into that and get some inspiration. And then, of course, I mentioned it in the interview, the Real Self-Love Handbook which includes the, the cornerstone process, this five-step process for liberating your authentic self, building resilience, and living an epic life. And I have a whole host of um, guided meditations. And yes, some of my workshops and retreats are, uh, are now being held online. So if you visit my website, andreapennington.com, you'll find pretty much everything there. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. We'll make sure you can find the link in the show notes to all the things that uh, Dr. Pennington talked about. Uh, Dr. Pennington, thank you so much for being on the podcast, for sharing your wisdom and knowledge, and for sharing your story. I often think that the beautiful, the best interviews, the best insights that we can get is we hear things from people's stories in, in a different way. Somebody's going to learn from you in a different way than they learn from somebody else. And when people are vulnerable about their stories, which you've done, um, in sharing about your story, not just here, but in other people's podcasts and shows, which we'll also link to below, there's an opening where we can see ourselves in it and take away some of the criticisms that we have and the self-judgment we have because we see that somebody else went through it. And I think that's only possible when somebody shares wholly and openly about their uh, story and experience. So I want to thank you for doing that for our audience and for uh, gracing us with your wisdom on the podcast. Oh, thank you, Drew. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate the opening and uh, the ability to share. And yes, I'm also looking forward to meeting you and sharing in person and feeling the vibe and the energy. But thank you again for this opportunity to share. It means a lot to me. Absolutely. You can find more about Dr. Andrea Pennington. If you're on Instagram, check her out. Dr. Andrea Pennington is her handle and follow her there. And for the rest of the links, you can find her in the show notes. Thank you for listening to the podcast. 